Hi, welcome everyone. I think we have some, some of our speakers already online, which is wonderful. Um, my name is Catherine. Hi everyone, sorry. Um, I think Catherine lost connectivity. We're just trying to get her reconnected. And given COVID, we really see that mental health has taken a center stage. So today we have a wonderful panel of speakers with us um, lined up to really focus on our own version Um, hi everyone. I think um, we can go ahead and have Crick Lund, Prof. Crick Lund um, from the CPMH, from the Allen J. Fletcher Center for Public Mental Health Care, um, present first. He's going to speak a bit about the, making the case for investing a bit more in um, mental health care in South Africa. I don't have his bio in front of me. Catherine was supposed to do the, um, the invitation, but unfortunately she got disconnected. Oh, the, the, um, introduction. Crick, would you mind introducing yourself just a little bit um, and then proceeding with your um, presentation, please? Thank you. Yes, yeah, sure. Thanks very much, Mahi. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, good. I've heard quite a few yeses coming in. Wonderful. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, it's really good to be with you here today and happy World Mental Health Day. Um, I'm uh, just loading up my presentation and um, I'm hoping you can see my screen. Um, so um, this is really an event uh, to mark uh, World Mental Health Day and it's really exciting how this uh, day has really gained momentum over the years. Um, uh, all people around the world involved in and interested in mental health joining forces to speak out about this incredibly important issue. And uh, my job today is really to share with you some of the uh, data we've been generating over the years to make the case for investing in mental health care in South Africa and also in many other African countries. So a lot of the examples and the data I'll be sharing today are related to South Africa, but I'm hoping they'll also be relevant. Okay. Please. Apologies, we can't see your we can't see your screen. I know we tested it before, but there seems to be an issue. Would you mind opening it in presentation mode and then resharing? Thank okay. You. Thank you. Um, let me just try this again. So I'm going to this. Here we go. Let's try this. Okay. Can you see me now? I mean, can you see the slide now? Maki, can you see the slide? Yes, Craig, sorry. Okay. Quick, we can see us. Sorry, I'm back now. Quick, we can see okay. us. Good. All right. Let's try again. <laughs> sorry, one moment, everybody. Apologies for the, the glitch. I was... Um, there we go. All right. Um, I'm hoping you can see my slides now, and if you can't, someone will let me know. Okay, good. So, uh, as I said, I'm going to be speaking about uh, the case for investing in mental health care, uh, especially in South Africa. And I'm going to give you seven good reasons why I think it's absolutely vital that we invest uh, in mental health um, in South Africa. The first reason is related to the burden of mental illness 
Um, we know from the global burden of disease uh, studies over the years that the proportion of the total uh, burden of sorry, disease. Your screens aren't your 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 slides aren't showing again. I'm sorry. Okay. There we go. I can see it now. Can you? Okay. Can you see it now? No, Craig. No, it's gone again. I think it's when it goes to the slide the slideshow part. So if you could keep it like that, it might be better. Okay. Um, I'm just not sure why it's not. So it go, it disappears as soon as I do that. Exactly. Okay. All right. Well, I think I'll just have to proceed. Um, without uh, showing the full screen. Um, so um, this is a slide showing the proportion of the total burden of mental of uh, disease attributable to mental illness over time. And you can see the percentage of total daddies increasing uh, globally to around 9.4% um, in 2016. And really, um, there's very good data now available for uh, South Africa on the global burden of disease estimates. You can see in this slide that around 15.39% uh, of the total South African population uh, will suffer from a mental, neurological, or substance use disorder uh, condition uh, during any given 12 months. Um, and that makes up around 18% of the years of life lived with disability uh, consumed by uh, mental, neurological, and substance use disorders. So this is a large proportion uh, of the population, many millions of people um, involved um, who could receive care, who could leave a, lead a much better quality of life. Um, despite this substantial burden of mental illness, there is significant underinvestment in mental health care. And um, so uh, we see that in the African region, only around uh, 10 cents is spent uh, per capita on mental health, compared to around 21.7 uh, US dollars uh, per annum in the European region. So the investment on mental health uh, globally is very unequally distributed, but it's also a massive underinvestment in relation to the burden of disease. And this leads to a significant treatment gap. Uh, the most recent estimates uh, in a paper led by Sumeya Dokrat and, and colleagues um, shows that around 92% of people living with a mental health condition or substance use condition or neurological condition will not receive any form of evidence-based care. Um, and this is just a massive loss of human potential. The fourth reason to invest in mental health care is that even within the resources that we do have available, there are massive inefficiencies in the way in which uh, mental health resources are used. And this is reflected, for example, in the readmission rate. Uh, in South Africa, around 24% of inpatients who are discharged will be readmitted within three months of having been discharged. Um, and this is what is often referred to as the revolving door pattern of care. Now, this is really just a massive loss of human potential um, and a, a massive uh, waste of resources because um, uh, the total costs associated with these re readmissions amounts to uh, almost 20% of the total mental health expenditure in the country. And this is reflected again in a paper um, that Sumeya Dokrat uh, led on mental health system costs, resources and constraints in South Africa. Um, if you're interested in this field, um, please go and have a look at those data. These provide the latest estimates of the resources and services available um, in South Africa. The fifth reason to invest in mental health is the ongoing human rights uh, violations associated with living with a mental illness. Uh, this is most graphically illustrated in 2015 and 2016 with the Life is City Mani tragedy. And I'm sure many of you are aware of this, where around 2,000 beds were closed in the Life Isidemani facility. Um, many uh, patients were discharged into the community, into unlicensed and unregulated uh, NGOs. And as a result, uh, over 140 individuals died in that uh, tragedy. 
So this is really an example of a deinstitutionalization gone wrong without adequate investment in primary care and community mental health services. There is huge uh, potential for harm to be caused um, through uh, deinstitutionalization. The sixth reason to invest in uh, mental health care is related to the economic costs of mental illness. Um, so this is often measured in what are referred to as days out of role. And, and these are data from a paper led by Sumeya Moll in 2014, where she examined the South African Stress and Health Survey data. Um, the SASH st uh, study, as many of you on know, is our only nationally representative sample. And days out of role provide a measure of the inability to work or carry out day-to-day -day activities. And uh, what we found in the study was that anxiety disorders and depression were associated with the highest days out of role, around 28.2 and 27.2 days per year, respectively, uh, out of all mental and physical illnesses. And there was a high level of comorbidity associated uh, with uh, both mental health and physical health conditions. Um, so we uh, conducted further analysis on the SASH data to look at the income lost associated with living with a mental illness. And essentially what we did was we compared the income of people living with severe mental illness in that sample uh, with the income of uh, people without a mental illness controlling for a range of other education and demographic variables. And we found that people living with a mental illness earned uh, on average, just shy of $5,000 less um, than per people uh, living without an, a mental illness. And in the year in which the survey was conducted, this cost the South African economy $3.6 billion. Uh, that is around 2.2% of uh, GDP in that year. And what's really interesting about this is that it uh, far outweighs the direct spending on mental health by the Department of Health uh, in 2005, around the same time, which in that year was $59 million. In other words, the indirect cost of mental illness far outweighs the direct spending. Or to, to put it more plainly, it costs us more to not treat mental illness than to treat uh, mental illness. And then the seventh reason to invest in mental health care is related to the return on investment potential from investing in mental health care. And this is the, the good news part of the story. Um, some really interesting work led by Dan Chisholm from the World Health Organization uh, in this study in 2016 showed that for every dollar invested in mental health care for depression and anxiety, there was a 2.3 to $3 dollar return on investment if one considers the economic benefits alone and then a 3.3 to $5.7 dollar return on investment if one includes health benefits. And uh, this is uh, estimated over the period of the Sustainable Development Goals from 2015 to 2030 and uh, presents a very compelling economic case for uh, investing in mental health care. And the picture that I put up here is a picture from the World Bank uh, WHO Summit that was held in April 2016 called Out of the Shadows, Making Mental Health a Global Development Priority. And this was really quite significant because for the first time, the World Bank was joining the World Health Organization in calling for greater investment in mental health from an economic development point of view. And you can see here in the picture, the president of the World Bank, Dr. Jim Kim, uh, at the time speaking to specifically to the issue and, and calling for greater investment uh, in mental health. So I believe those are seven really compelling uh, reasons to invest in mental health. Um, here in South Africa, we are taking this work forward with a national investment case for mental health in, uh, in South Africa. We're working with the National Treasury and the National Department of Health uh, to build this investment case. And I just want to acknowledge Sumeya Dokrat and Donella Basado, who are really leading this work, uh, two health economists um, who are doing wonderful work in this area. And uh, we've been going through a process, first of all, of provincial visits and consultations. Uh, we've completed six of the nine provincial visits. Unfortunately, this was put on hold by COVID. 
Um, but we are continuing with online uh, consultations with the remaining three provinces. Secondly, we've been undertaking a Delphi consensus study to gather opinions and recommendations on priority areas uh, to invest in for mental health in South Africa. And then thirdly, uh, Sumeya and Donella have been working with this uh, wonderful tool called the One Health Tool, which provides a very sophisticated way of modeling the costs of mental health care packages, the, the impact of those packages on mental health and disability, and also the economic return on investment uh, for those uh, packages of care. And uh, this is at a fairly advanced stage. We're hoping to present some of this work to um, the mental, National Mental Health Think Tank in a few weeks' time, and we'll be presenting the results to Treasury uh, in the months ahead. So um, watch this space. I want to uh, finish off by uh, picking up a bit on the theme of this webinar, which is to speak a little bit more to what mental health care should look like. Uh, I think I've presented seven quite, what I think are quite compelling reasons for investing in mental health care. Um, but what should mental health care actually look like and how should we go about transforming uh, the mental health system as it currently exists? Well, um, first of all, I think it's very important to bear in mind uh, the World Health Organization's uh, optimal mix of services uh, model, which was first published in 2003 in the uh, mental health policy and service guidance package and really uh, presents um, services as a, as a form of pyramid where at the top of the pyramid we have long-stay facilities and specialist mental health services um, just below them psychiatric services and general hospitals and community mental health services and then primary care services informal community care and self-care and what we find as we go up the pyramid is that the costs of delivering these services increase, um, but also as we go up the pyramid, the uh, frequency of need for these services in the population decreases. And I think this is a very, very helpful framework. I'm sure many of you have come across this, and I think it still rings very true today, uh, mainly because in most uh, of uh, African countries and South Africa uh, is included in this, the pyramid is upside down. Most of the resources are concentrated in the specialist facilities, and there's very little in primary care and in community settings. And this is really where we need to shift things. Uh, this doesn't mean disinvesting from specialist services, and we saw some of the risks of doing that too rapidly with Lipis and Demeni. But what it does mean is investing new resources in primary care and community mental health care. So these are some of the priorities which have been emerging from the Delphi consultation process um, that we've uh, been engaged in for the national investment case. And I just wanted to flag some of these. We'd be very interested to hear comments and suggestions on these. Um, but essentially, they cover three broad areas. First of all, it's really important that we invest in governance for mental health care. Without good governance, it's very difficult to translate our excellent policies and legislation into uh, real uh, services on the ground that make a real difference in the lives of the people who need them. So we need uh, more investment in national, provincial, and district level mental health service governance. For example, our mental health policy calls for a director post in each of the nine provinces. And I currently, I think we only have them in three provinces. Um, secondly, it's vital that we build intersectoral coordination between the range of different sectors involved in mental health care. I see that I'm just about out of time, so I'll be wrapping up soon. Um, so the Department of Social Development, along with the Department of Health, uh, basic education and higher education, um, housing, transport, all of these sectors have a bearing on mental health. And it's really important uh, from a governance point of view that we coordinate these very well, not only at the national level, but very importantly uh, down at the district level as well. We need better information systems to provide good real-time data on the delivery of services for mental health. And we need investment in infrastructure, especially in district and regional hospitals um, where there is a need to provide uh, care for people who are admitted into, in terms of the Mental Health Care Act for 72-hour observations. Then in terms of population priorities, 
the main priorities that have emerged so far are maternal mental health, women during pregnancy in the first year of their baby's lives, uh, children and adolescents vastly neglected and uh, a really critical developmental stage to prevent uh, mental health problems later in life, um, adults with severe mental illness and adults with comorbid chronic conditions such as HIV, TB and non-communicable diseases often have high levels of depression and anxiety and substance use conditions. And then finally, older adults are really, again, very neglected population and in terms of our rapidly aging population, really vital for care, especially around dementia. And then thirdly, the, the delivery platforms really, which really need investment are primary care, school-based programs, especially promotion and prevention interventions, community care to support adherence to medication and psychosocial rehabilitation, uh, community-based residential care, and then very importantly, forensic mental health care. And I want to conclude by just mentioning uh, some of the initiatives which we've been involved in in recent years to conduct research on models of integrating mental health into primary care. Um, this was uh, in the early days initiated through the PRIME study and I just want to acknowledge the team involved in, in leading the PRIME work, uh, Inga Peterson, Arvin Barner, Lara Farrell, uh, and the team who've uh, built this model initially in the Northwest province in the Dr. Kenneth Kowinda district um, and then have scaled this up to a number of other districts and are busy very actively working especially in KwaZulu-Natal um, at the moment. And uh, this model, uh, please do have a look at this paper if you want to see more about how um, this model is actually spelt out and, and the details of, of how mental health can be integrated into uh, primary health care. Um, and it's been further developed through the MINT program, the Mental Health Integration Program, which has really gone into some detail on the mechanics of how do we scale up mental health care, essentially following three steps of plan, prepare, and provide. Um, and it's very important as we build capacity of primary care clinics and primary care staff that we pay very close attention to continuous quality improvement as really the engine which uh, drives these uh, processes. So finally, how do we go about funding and delivering interventions? Who should deliver? Well, essentially all of us. It's a, a multidisciplinary, uh, intersectoral uh, approach that is required to address both the social causes and consequences of mental illness. And it's vital that government, uh, that international development agencies, and also corporate organizations through mental health programs in the workplace, uh, come to the party and invest for all the reasons that I mentioned. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions and comments. Thank you, Kat. Uh, thanks so much, Kirk. I think that really sets the scene um, for we want to move to uh, here in South Africa. And I apologize to everyone for some of the technical difficulties we've had. Um, but I think we're going to move forward quite quickly. We don't want to run out of time. Um, so as you know, this webinar is jointly hosted by us and the South African Depression and Anxiety Group. So our next speaker is from there. It's Cassie Chambers, who started at the South African Depression and Anxiety Group as a volunteer over 12 years ago and is now the, well, after 10 years, is now the operations director and the board member. So Cassie, I'm going to pass over to you um, without further ado. And hopefully if I don't get kicked off, I'm, I apologize if I get kicked off again, but I'll, I'll have backup this time. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Kat, and thanks to everyone for, for joining us today, wherever you are all around the country um, and even throughout Africa. It's really great um, to be hosting this and having this really important conversation. So thanks again just for, for having us. Um, World Mental Health Day is a really important day in our health calendar. Um, it's really important to SADAG too, because we get to talk about mental health on all these various platforms. And one of the opportunities that COVID has presented to us is that we can now host more webinars wherever we are and connect with more people and share more about what's happening with mental health and to advocate and to create awareness. So I'm really thrilled that we can talk today. And I think um, the topic, uh, around and the international theme for World Mental Health Day, looking at greater investment, greater access, is so important. People that reach out to SADAG on a daily basis through our helplines and our website and our SMSs are people who are really desperate and feel often very helpless and hopeless when trying to get help. 
And whatever we, we can do as SADAG to create awareness and advocate for those patients to ensure that they do get help. And, you know, hearing from Prof with regards to some of the, the stats that over 92% of people with a mental health issue don't have access to treatment, we have to do more and better for those people. So one of the things I'm going to be sharing today is a little bit about uh, digital interventions, something that we all know very, very well during COVID with all of us going online and being forced to enter this digital world, um, sometimes kicking and screaming. Um, but I think it's really interesting and really important because again, so many people have been accessing help. And I'm gonna be sharing a little bit about some of the insights that SADAG has created or developed over the last six months and some of the surveys and research that we've seen. And hopefully we can discuss some ideas about going forward. So when I started just having a look um, at some of the stats and the figures around the world and around Africa, around how we use digital platforms and online services. There's about four and a half billion people that access or use internet around the world. And that was numbers that were released just now in July. And out of those, about 11% of the internet users in the world come from Africa. We're dealing with 522 million people in Africa who are using internet on a daily basis. When we look for even further how they're accessing this help, and it's really important to know is that in 2019, 99% of the total social media users were using their phones, mobile devices. And I think this just tells us what people are using and how we can reach more people on a daily basis. So one of the things I'm hoping all tech, so please hold full thumbs and toes as we share screen here. Um, I really do hope this does present if if not please do let me know yeah we can see it thank you Cassie. Yes. fantastic okay well that's great news um so we're just going to be talking a little bit from sadag's perspective um some of you have might have known around who we are and what we do we're the south african depression and anxiety group we've been around for 26 years and the core of what we do is we provide free telephone counseling through our 22 helpline call center which are manned by amazing volunteers. We also run support groups, do community outreach, press and media and trainings all around mental health. It's about destigmatizing mental illness and providing support. So one of the things, and, and this is you know the traditional look and feel of what we know, office, a space, brick and mortar. This was our call center where our volunteers would come in every day and help answer calls and field calls. And just before COVID and lockdown, we were receiving about 600 calls a day from people all over the country and all ages reaching out for help. Um, our volunteers are trained and you can see some of them there in the call center and we are an NPO, so we don't look all fancy like corporate, but our counselors are there to really care and listen. And this is how we function for, for 26 years. We were busy, bustling, noisy, um, but that's sometimes part of the magic that we had with being in one space. And then COVID happened. And this also then just opened up, perhaps we can call it forced us to go digital and online or opened up the opportunity. And one of the things from when the president first announced lockdown, we had three days to decide and to move SADAG how we've traditionally run for 26 years. And for the first time, we had to close our doors officially as in a physical space and start to move our services online in the digital space. And to tell you that it was nerve wracking and stressful is an understatement, because we wanted to ensure that there was no disruption in our services to people who need it every single day. And that's so true, especially during COVID, is that the first day of lockdown in South Africa was the report of the first death due to COVID. And that actually triggered a lot of people where it made it so much more real, so much more serious, and everyone's anxiety and stress levels had increased. And then we've gone to our new normal. Some of the things that we did during this time of COVID is moving our entire helpline and all of our volunteers who were now working from home, and we moved our switchboard and our helplines to an app really quickly, and thank goodness for our switchboard company, Trinity. But counselors were now set up to counsel remotely from home, so we had to make everything go digital very quickly, referral guides, accessing helplines. Normally when you're in the office, you're able to ask for help and speak to people. And now we really had to challenge how we communicate. And thank goodness for WhatsApp. We have many a WhatsApp group where our counselors can now connect and share and help each other out on a shift 
when often you can feel quite isolated with counseling from home. We have over 200 extensions with all our volunteers who went into lockdown what we thought was going to be three weeks and then an the extension of two weeks. Uh, many had gone home um, to be with families. So we were really just connecting this almost national virtual call center. And it was really important that we did because we instantly saw a huge increase in the demand of our services and people needing help. And our call volumes literally doubled since the first month after lockdown. So from April and May, we've seen our call volumes rise and grow every single day from people just really struggling and not coping. And I think when we have to put those numbers and figures into perspective is that those are people who have resources, who have heard about SADAG, who've reached out. Um, and it's quite daunting to think someone having to pick up the phone and speak to a stranger and say, I'm not doing okay. You can only imagine that exponential figure of people on the ground in communities at a grassroots level who don't know about SADAG or don't know about how to get help or too afraid to get help and how they're suffering. So there's a lot more people that were impacted by COVID um, on a mental health level. We also saw a huge increase in people accessing or needing services online. We were getting over hundreds of WhatsApp messages every day, people reaching out by email, by SMS, we had to even run daily Facebook chats with experts just answering questions. And at any given chat, we used to run them daily between, I think it was 12 and 1. We would have over, you know, 5,000, 16,000 people logged in at any given time, desperate for information. So this is our new normal. These are our wonderful volunteers who set up their own call centers from home. Some of the advantages is you can now counsel in your pajamas in your bedroom but the the setup and the need is still there and this is now our new normal where everything has gone online and during this time we've set up various whatsapp groups um, to set up support for every shift of our counselors we've also hosted various webinars for training purposes for our counselors because we also had to learn about covid pick up on the themes we were getting in the call center and bringing on experts so that we can continuously train our counselors and we now have over 40 uh, training webinars that we've done. We also had to continue recruiting new volunteers and we ran an e-learning program or an e-training program with our new volunteers. We also started to run online support groups for our counselors. We even had yoga sessions and mindfulness. So again, in a time of huge uncertainty and fear and frustration, we were able to look outside of the box and provide some more support. Then, Normally in the call center, we didn't have those opportunities or those times. We've hosted many a meeting on Zoom. We are definitely hashtag team Zoom. And I'm sure for everyone who has been inundated with webinars and meetings, um, these platforms again allow us to connect um, more so than ever before. Something really exciting that we also did during lockdown is that we launched the Healthcare Workers Care Network, which is a specific program looking after the mental health of our frontline healthcare workers. And this was all done remotely. We had over 200 mental health professionals who had volunteered their time to man this new helpline. So we connected them through our new technology that we had and these new online platforms that we could connect them in for a two hour shift, seven days a week, and we made sure that they were qualified mental health professionals to answer calls from specialists on the front line, which is amazing that something like that can happen so quickly and people could plug in wherever they are. We also have had to increase the number of counselors monitoring our WhatsApp um, with more people accessing help and needing ongoing support. One of the things we've also had to do is that before COVID and before lockdown, we had over 160 support groups who used to meet every two weeks, once a month, face to face, who now have had to really challenge how they connect with their members who needed support now more than ever and ran online groups, uh, Zoom sessions, Google Hangouts, Skype, and many even running WhatsApp groups just to connect and offer support. And that's even been part of our, our new division within our support group as we're training more and more people to run online support groups. And we've launched many over the last few months. We've also looked at training new support group leaders. And, and this is really important because these support groups provide free support and networking and connection, especially in areas with little or no resources. And we know in South Africa, we don't have enough mental health professionals or enough hospitals or enough treatment 
So having these kinds of mechanisms are really, really important. Something also pretty cool is that we were able to partner with Twitter um, so that any users on Twitter who were posting any kind of comments or messages around depression, anxiety, self-harm, or even suicide, would get prompted immediately to say, please reach out to SADAG. And this just helped us to make sure that all those algorithms and bots that lived in the Twitter universe could actually go and find those people who were struggling and posting or using Twitter as a platform to say that they're not coping. And now more people knew that they could reach out to SADAG. So it just shows you how we could use technology. And we've developed the same kinds of relationships with Facebook and Instagram as well, so that the social media users who are potentially not doing well can access help. Um, what we've seen, and this just gives you an idea of how our calls have increased over the last six, seven months. Um, we've seen a slight plateau, but we're seeing more people reaching out for help. And this is just our incoming calls over the last seven months. Um, and it's something that we monitor on a daily basis to see where are the trends, where are the themes, what can we do to provide more support. Um, and it just shows you by having access to this data and information, we can instantly look at how do we help more people and what support should be going in. Something that we did and we just released um, this week in, in lieu of you know, upcoming World Mental Health Day tomorrow is just to track again, what have we seen and what have we learned at SADAG? And you know, trying to put a little bit of perspective into mental health, especially in South Africa during this time. And we monitored that from January to September, we reached or we received over 315,000 calls from people around the country. And to put that in even visual perspective is that that's over three and a third full F and B stadium of people reaching out for help. And again, exponentially, visually, I want you to imagine all of the extra people that would be needing help on the ground and who have not been able to get that help. Even more concerning is that we've received over 65,000 suicide calls um, during that time. And one of the difficulties we have is accessing resources and enough wards. And during COVID, many psychiatric wards were actually converted or reduced to make sure there was more help for, for COVID patients. Something that I'd like to also just raise then to show is that we've seen an increase in the percentage of callers from last year to this year by 63%. And, and that's a lot to do with the amount of people reaching out online via WhatsApp, SMS, email, our online contact forms, or even social media. We also did a survey earlier, and you can all find this also on SADAG's website, is just trying to understand, and it seems so long ago, we did this in April, six months ago, where we wanted to just understand the mental health impact during COVID and what people were struggling with. Um, and we knew that, you know, 65% of people felt stressed or very stressed during lockdown, which I think all of us and relate to, and we've just seen that grow and grow. Something I'd like to highlight here as well is the, the main age group from the participants that participated in the survey was that they were young people accessing help. And we know that young people turn to social media, digital platforms to reach out, to share, to connect, to find information. So SADAG has have to make sure that we're on those platforms to access those target age groups especially when we know that the most at-risk age group for suicide in South Africa is our adolescents and young adults. So we have to make sure that we're on those platforms to reach out and get help. Some of the things that we also saw, and, and this again just shows us that digital intervention, where are people playing, is we're seeing that people were accessing information around COVID and COVID and mental health mainly online. Um, and that's also just showing us how we're needing to make information fast, quick, at people's fingertips. This was a, a really exciting um, survey that we, we did with the launch of COVID um, and so many people having to think outside the box. We didn't want people who needed help to stop seeing their psychologist or psychiatrist. And I think that's when we saw telehealth or telecounseling, online counseling, really boom in South Africa for the first time and more and more people talking about it, more and more practices converting and more patients reaching out for help. And the survey, I know that there's lots of information, but again, it is available on the SADAG website. And I urge you go have a look, go and see some of the stats and figures and see 
what you think. We did a survey um, just over six weeks ago um, with both patients or clients as well as mental health professionals to really understand their experience of telehealth during COVID. One of the interesting findings that came out is that the most used platform, despite the huge increase in marketing around online platforms for uh, digital com consultations, medical aids were launching, there were so many different companies that were launching these safe online consultation sessions. The most used was Zoom where we had 58% of patients using Zoom, as well as 81% of mental health professionals using Zoom as a platform to, to connect and to see. Some of the challenges, however, and we saw that even in today's webinar, is connection, internet connection network is often one of the biggest challenges to telehealth, especially in South Africa. As well as for mental health professionals, reading nonverbal cues, it was quite difficult. Um, in a lot of the online sessions is that you don't get to physically be in a space and be able to, to see all of those nonverbal cues. One of the silver linings around all of this is we were very pleased to see that 87% of the mental health professionals who completed the survey were offering pro bono services. Um, and that again just tells us that there are so many people who really do want to help and do want to connect. Some of the, the common themes that came out from the survey was people accessing telehealth for depression, anxiety, and panic attacks mainly. Um, and some of the, the comments that came out of the survey is that we're seeing more mental health professionals who are wanting to continue with telehealth sessions post COVID. Uh, we're looking at about, I think it was about 58%, I can just go back, um, that would like to, 68% that would still like to continue with telecounseling post COVID, um, whereas with mental health professionals, there were a lot more that actually wanted to continue with telehealth. And we even had some com you know, comments from the various mental health professionals who were psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, who were saying that we hope that telecounseling is here to stay. Some of the key things that I think from the survey we also learned is some of the issues around funding or reimbursement by medical aids, with some mental health professionals partially being paid by medical aids or patients or clients having to pay up front and claim back later. I know at the beginning of lockdown, there was a lot of controversy around uh, full reimbursement of telehealth sessions. So that is something that could definitely be worked on going forward if we're going to make telehealth stay. So, while we're talking about connecting and sharing and starting these conversations, um, I urge you to please do follow us on Twitter. Um, even though we're talking about this topic of digital interventions, um, a lot of people here could share even helpful apps around mental health that they use or share or, or know other people using. And please do share them in the chat box because I think it's always great when you can hear what apps are working, what are not. We still need a proper South African mental health app. Um, so if there's any app developers, please do reach out. Um, SADEG is actually participating in a research study currently looking at a new CBT app for South Africa. Um, so we're hoping that, again, there will be more resources available. You also can follow us on our Facebook page. Um, we're actually going to be having a chat this afternoon, uh, probably now, um, where we're just talking about mental health providing free advice by mental health professionals to people asking questions online. So I think to, to end off and to conclude a little bit around what I'm talking about and what I'm hoping that your, your, mess, your lasting message from today could be is that one of the concerns we do have with digital interventions or digital mental health and online mental health is that it's only open to a small percentage of people who need the help. It's people who have access to internet, who have access to data, who have access to smartphones, or, or have the, 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 the technological acumen to use these different platforms. There's still a large majority of people who are in disadvantaged areas, who don't have data, who don't have money. How did they access this new digital world of mental health support and help? And while we're moving forward and we're growing exponentially every day with more and more information online, what is happening to those people on the ground at a grassroots level? And are they going to be left behind as mental health is revolutionized going forward? Online has changed how NPOs, companies, organizations work and have had to work. 
and really challenged our resilience in making sure that we can function and provide resources still online. But it's also changed how we help people on a daily basis. And something that we at SADAG are continually learning and learning from the people who are reaching out for help because they're our biggest source of information and we can tweak it according to them. There's definitely a need for more digital interventions, digital resources that could help at a community level. And I saw one of the questions in the chat box about what happens with community mental health. Is we don't have a great community mental health strategy or framework in South Africa. And as Prof mentioned earlier, we had life to many. And I don't think much has changed since then to strengthen or improve community mental health in South Africa. So again, that's definitely a big highlight that we should look at. I think also to, to find balance in this new digital world is that we still like to connect. And in a time of physical distancing, we still need to socially connect. And, and there's the huge power in having a meaningful conversation or feeling part of a group. Um, and, and during these times, more than ever, is about connection and being around people and feeling wanted. And I think for any mental health care user or anyone who's got lived experience, that can sometimes be really lonely. And I'm hoping that with us going online and digital, that we can still find those safe spaces to connect. One of the things that I think we challenge ourselves as well on a daily basis is also to be careful about too much digital and having to take digital detox to look after our mental health. There's also a lot of research that's come from overseas and even more recently here in South Africa about the impact of online platforms or social media to our mental health. And that's something we also have to consider going forward is to find that perfect balance if that's possible. So thank you very much for sharing. I look forward to reading your questions in the chat box and please do engage. And I hope that shared a little bit more insight as to what we've been experiencing during COVID. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Cassa. I always find it really amazing how SADAG is able to adapt um, regardless of the situation. And I think it just really shows strong leadership, governance and dedication from all of your staff. So congratulations um, to all of you. Uh, so our next speaker, so we're, it's already 120, so we're going to move forward. I see she's online, which is great, um, is Dr. Cindy Van Sale. So I hear that you're not only a physician, but a radio DJ, and you use this platform to share all the HIV-related mental health and other medical information. So um, pa I'll pass over to you. Thank you so much, and, and welcome to everyone um, that's on this platform. Cassie, thank you so much for your talk. So I'm on the board of the Southern African Depression and Anxiety Group with Cassie, and um, you know, Cassie invited me to just share a bit of my story because I'm living with depression. Um, and um, you know, I was diagnosed with depression in um, April 2013, but leading up to that had been about a year of, of, of sheer turmoil. Um, I was suffering from postpartum depression. Um, I'd been promoted at work, and I didn't enjoy the work that I was doing. Um, I'm a clinician at heart, and they'd made me a manager. So I was very miserable with that, and I couldn't, I couldn't articulate it to anybody. And um, we'd moved house. So in a short, in a short space of time, within, within, in the space of two years, I'd had a baby, a second child. I wasn't coping with two children. Um, I'd, I'd, we'd moved house abruptly, and I'd been made a manager. And so as that year, when I, when I look back at 2012, and I, I've been able to put it into words, as, as that year progressed, I just became a shell of, of who I am. And I remember saying to my friends that, you know, guys, I actually think I'm depressed. I think I've, I'm, I'm, I've, I've got all the signs and symptoms of, of clinical depression. And the thing is, if you're a medical doctor, and, and most of the people in your circles are medical doctors, I don't think we really take each other's... Um, um, ailments seriously. You know, we talk about these things, we laugh about it. And so my friends and I would, would I'd say it, we'd laugh about it and they'd say to me, oh, I'm just being a drama queen. I must just get over it and so on. And, and this carried on for a while. And eventually, on the 1st of April in 2013, I had a mental breakdown. So I woke up in the morning and I couldn't do anything. And I reached out to a doctor friend who herself, um, a few weeks before that, had shared her story of depression with me. And I'll never know to this day why she chose to share her story with me, but she shared it with me. Um, I had her number because I knew her from before. And on that day when I woke up and I wasn't able to function, all I could do was cry. I knew that I had to phone her. So I called and I said to her, listen, I'm in a bit of a mess. I can't get up, I can't look after my kids, I'm not okay. And she said to me, well, it sounds like you've had a mental breakdown. Um, call your GP and, and let's see what happens. So. I phoned my GP 
And then I managed to get up, get up, get out of bed, you know, wash, try and look decent, try and look normal. I mean, I wasn't even sleeping in, in the main bedroom anymore. I was so tired and I didn't want anyone around me. I was sleeping in the guest bedroom. So when the GP arrived, you know, I was lying in bed, acting normal, trying to act as if, um, you know, I was in the, sleeping in the main bedroom. And this is, this, is, this is the thing about living with depression is that you get very good at, um, you know, putting on a happy face. You're able to wake up in the morning and put on your happy face and get to work and just get on with it. So many people are walking around acting as if everything is okay, but on the inside, they're actually very empty. And this is what, what I was for, for at least a year. So the GP arrived um, with his wife. Um, he asked me five questions, um, you know, pertaining to depression. I answered all of them and I just started crying and I was inconsolable. And he said to me, and he said to my husband that, you know, your wife needs to be admitted into a mental hospital. I mean, her level of depression, um, you know, psychology alone is not going to work. Medication is not going to work. She needs to be admitted. So I agreed to be admitted because I knew that I needed help. But the challenge, of course, was my mother. So I'm an only child. And um, my mom dedicated her whole life to making sure that I, be I became a medical doctor. So I'd been speaking to her about what I was feeling, right? I'd, I'd see her and I said to her mama, I'm not okay. There's something wrong with me. And all she ever said to me was, well, she doesn't understand why I'm not okay because she's worked very hard to make sure I've become a medical doctor. I'm married. I have two beautiful kids. I'm working. I have a car. So she had a whole shopping list of reasons why I should not be depressed. Right. And the more I said this to her, especially in the weeks leading up to my breakdown, the more she prayed. So her and my aunt, their solution to my mental health problems was prayer and holy oil and casting out demons. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? I'm a born again Christian. There's nothing wrong with that. But that is not what I needed at that time. And I think the hardest thing for my mother was to accept that there's, there may be something more serious happening with her child, right? And this really speaks to the black community and our understanding of mental illness and just how we can't, you know, if someone's life looks okay from the outside, what do you have to complain about, right? And this is something that I, I needed to mention because it is a barrier to black, the black community accessing mental health services. In any case, what, we, what I then decided was that um, I'd let the doctor arrange the admission, speak to my medical aid, get, the, get the, um, um, the, the approval and everything sorted out, and would only tell my mother on the day that I was going for admission. Because if we had told her beforehand, she'd have rushed through from Woodbank, you know, with the holy oil and everything else to try and, you know, make sure that this doesn't happen. And that's exactly what we did. The medical aid approved everything. And on my birthday, my 37th birthday, I was then admitted to um, Portview uh, in, in Rudeport, in Remsech. Very nice place, very nice facility, private facility. And that's when I got the care that I needed. Um, my mom did come to visit me at the facility. Um, she was very disappointed. She was very, very unhappy. And she kept asking me, you know, Mrs. Zulu, like, Cindy, and, and, you know, meaning, what are you doing here with all these people? But it's a look on her face that I'll never forget. She was disgusted that I was in a mental hospital. But I was okay. I was on medication. And I was able to answer her questions and just say to her that, listen, this is where I need to be. You know, I, this is not about you or me upsetting you or trying to be funny. I need to be here. And for the first time in my life, you know, I, I wasn't a doctor. I wasn't a mommy. I wasn't a wife. I wasn't, um, you know, a personality. I wasn't a media personality. I was just a broken Cindy that needed help. And it was great. It was great to, to be in, in, a, in a structured place where, you know, I had psychology, I had psychotherapy every day. There was group therapy. We had activities like knitting and painting and, and making stuff. And all of that was very healing for me. Um, but obviously the hard journey still lay ahead because my mom had sworn me to secrecy and she didn't want a single person to know why I'd been admitted. So at work, HR knew and, and um, my, my boss knew. Um, my family, immediate family knew, but nobody else knew. And I'm a social media personality. So obviously I disappear for, a, for, for, for three weeks and I come back and people can't understand where I was. So I kept her secret. I honored her um, for that. Um, I didn't even tell my dad who lives in Zimbabwe. And then seven weeks later, seven weeks after I was admitted into hospital, tragedy struck and my mom passed away. So she was diabetic, she had high blood pressure and um, she got sick and within five days she was gone. And that really was um, 
a big blow for me because just as I was, I was getting better in terms of the medication kicking in, because it takes about six weeks to kick in, then you know the most important person in my life passes away. So my therapy sessions then changed and became more focused on dealing with grief. And um, you know my psychiatry, my psychiatrist then upped my medication. She added another drug um, so that I could cope. And that's really the only way I was able to get through the funeral and and everything else that followed. If it wasn't the fact for the fact that I was on medication and that I was in psychotherapy, I honestly don't think I'd be here today. I don't think I'd have survived, um, you know, my mom's passing away and everything else that followed. Um, so a year later, I then left the job where I was at because I was tired. I was exhausted. I I had done my best. I'd um, committed to honoring all the projects I'd started working on, and I made sure that by May 2014, um, those projects were complete. I also made sure that the person that took over from me um, was one of my best friends. We worked together, and I said to her, I will not leave if you don't take over this program, right? This program means the world to me, but I need to, I need to leave. I need to just take a step back and just figure out, you know, what my life looks like and where I'm going. So she was gracious enough to take over and she's still at that organization doing really well. And that's how I ended up leaving um, the place where I used to work. I stayed at home for a year. And then after a year, I came back um, into medicine space slowly, obviously, and I came back into private practice. So I don't really enjoy private practice. I always say this, but um, certainly for, for, for the changed person that I am, because depression changes you and so does grief. For the changed person that I am and for the way I handle my life now in terms of managing my energy, managing my mental health, making sure I get self-care, I needed to work in an environment where I could control the number of patients I'm seeing. So I'm, a, I'm still a very passionate clinician, but I only work four times a week and I only see seven patients a day and that's really what has helped me to 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 stay alive right to stay alive to to be the best wife that i can be to be the best mommy that i can be and to be the best doctor that i can be and this is why it's so important for people to get diagnosed as soon as possible i i feel that if i had been diagnosed earlier right um the if that interventions had started earlier um i don't think i'd have, it would have been as severe as it as it was but again because we don't want to talk we don't want to um accept that there may be something wrong. I think the medical fraternity itself struggles with other healthcare pr practitioners who are um, who have mental illness. That's something we have to, do, we have to look into. Um, there's a lot that must still be done. In terms of family, um, my family has been very supportive. Um, I think um, after my mom passed away, I, a year later, I came out, I told everyone my story. I shared it on social media and I've been giving such talks ever since. Um, they've been very supportive. They don't always understand um, you know, what it is, but I explain in the best way that I can. Um, in terms of friends, um, it was very unfortunate that I had to break away from a, a close bunch of friends of mine who are all medical doctors. There's a bunch of them that um, were, were unhappy with the fact that I was sharing my mental health um, issues on, on public platforms and they thought that I was being embarrassing. And I feel that if you're a medical practitioner or a healthcare professional and you can't understand a friend's mental health issues. How on earth are you going to understand the mental health issues of somebody else? So I cut ties with them, which is very sad because I had to find a new bunch of friends, but I've been much better since then. Um, I was on medication for four and a half years. Um, I was in therapy for four and a half years. Um, I think COVID-19 was challenging, as Cassie pointed out. It was very challenging for me. I think level five lockdown was the worst thing I've been through since my mom died. Um, it was horrible. Um, so I had a bit of a wobbly then. So I went back into therapy, online therapy, but just, just to get me through those first few weeks of trying to understand why, we, you know, can't go out um and just this just get out level five was horrible but i'm much better now because the sun has come out and we're on level one lockdown um in terms of managing um my day-to-day -day, um one thing that's important for you to tell your patients is that depression doesn't go away so it's not something that you get and, then, and you get antibiotics and then it's gone you live with it so you learn to live with it and you learn to manage it and um therapy is what is you know is what really helps a person to move forward living with depression or any other mental illness for that matter and i think with me cognitive behavioral therapy is what changed my life so my therapist um you know i'm i'm a, I'm a highly strung person and i'm a perfectionist and i want everything to go my way it's like it's my way or the highway especially when it comes to work and medicine and the way life is, not everything's going to go your way. And you need, to, you need to find a way of being able to cope with that. So my therapist taught me to count to 10 and ask myself if I'm going to die if something doesn't go my way. So whenever I'm faced with a, with a, a potential crisis, when things are not going my way, when I feel I'm about to have a major wobbly, I count to 10 and I ask myself, will I die if 
you know, the prescription pads haven't arrived or will I die if um, the medical aids haven't paid by Friday? And that's really how I, I get through life by just managing each crisis, assessing the situation, and then of course, um, measuring my response to it. Um, and then that's what CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, did for me. Um, so I'm not going to take too much of your time because I want to answer as many questions as I can. But that's my story in a nutshell. Um, I've just tried to share the most important points of, of um, you know, living with mental illness. It's not easy. Um, and speaking up is not easy. Speaking up about it is certainly not for everybody. So I always say to people that don't, don't, don't feel that you now must become this activist and you must now share with everybody that you're living with mental illness. Not everybody understands it, right? So, so just make sure when you do disclose, especially in the workplace, be very careful about who you disclose to and even in your family. Disclose to people who you feel will be supportive of you and not to people who are going to drag you down and make fun of of um of, of of what you're sharing. So I hope I hope I've made a bit of sense this afternoon, and this is my contribution to this con to this um conversation. Wow! Thank you so much for sharing your story, Cindy. I think you're quite an inspiration, and I think your story has clearly resonated um, with so many people on this chat room, as you're going to see. Um, and I really it really shows for me a lot of courage and 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 bravery and I hope that it does encourage others whether it's healthcare providers to access care because we know that treatment works as you say but you need to be willing and open so thank you very much so uh, the last speaker for us today I see he's online is Tabo Do I see hi, hi how are you I'm, how are Tabo. You? I'm fine thank you how are you so I understand you also have many hats you're a husband a father you're a life coach, a public speaker, you're a leadership developer and public administrator. Is there um, yeah, problems? yeah. I, I, I would just, you know, just to track back, I'm definitely not a father. I can, I can definitely tell you that. Not a father at all. Um, okay. I'm, 20, I'm 23 years old. I'm very, yeah, yeah I'm very far from it. Uh, I'm just going to say I'm a very right. young man, very passionate about a lot of things. Um, yeah. Wonderful. So that was miscommunication. My apologies. But yeah, let me, let me hand okay. over to you. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah, so just to discuss my story, um, it all began in 20, 2018 or 2017, roughly around that time. And it was a very difficult time for me um, during that time. And um, at that point, um, I was in my second year of university. I was studying my uh, strategic communication degree. And um, towards the end of 2017, I started to feel um, very down, very low. And I didn't want to interact with any, like, any person that was out. There. And I was in a relationship at the time as well um, with someone who I did really care about, but I became very distant with them when they wanted to talk to me. I didn't want to be on my phone. I didn't want anything to do with anyone. And I think that is when the starting point of my depression had started. And I did not realize it at that particular point, because every time I think as youngsters, sometimes we look at some people with depression or anxiety and we look at that and we say, ah, oh, that person is just a phase, you know, they're just going through something. They'll be okay. And it really isn't like that. And I think a lot of young people don't understand that it really doesn't function like that. And it's never that easy to do. Um, so yeah, towards the end of the year, I remember uh, I had a holiday with friends going to Cape Town and it was just very, very difficult. I, there's nothing I could do. And I mean, you're going to Cape Town, you know, you should be excited. You're going to Cape Town. It's an amazing time. And like, it was my first time. I'm not even excited. I don't want to be there. And my first night arriving in Cape Town, the first thing I did was cry and just cry and cry and cry. And I only had one friend who actually like noticed that, okay, something is not okay. Um, with Tabo and there's there's a problem that he's having um, and I had to leave Cape Town I think just before New Year's Eve just to come back to Joburg to understand like what is happening with me because there were so many things that were in my mind and mostly it had to do with suicide most of the time I just thought about how I think life is not amazing and I don't have any purpose to live and I don't want to be here and on top of that I was chasing a lot of dreams of mine like doing radio uh, commercial radio and there's a, a lot of things that were factoring into okay maybe life is not amazing right um, some of it stems back to how I grew up, like my childhood. So I have an amazing mother and she does the best, you know, for me all the time till this day. Um, but I had a sister who just, you know, um, used to sort of like emotionally and sort of, I would say, physically abuse me when I was a child. Um, and I think for my mom, she did not notice this because at the end of the day, like, you know, we both her children, but she didn't understand how when it's holiday season and it's time as a grade two or a grade three. And my sister's like nine years older than me that she would abuse me for just being the last born. And all of that type of stuff starting to just pick up because now I could not trust people anymore because now I feel like at some point someone's just going to hurt my feelings, whether that's people, friends, whatever the case may be. And that started to just grow on me the more and more towards my third and final year of university itself. And by 2018, that's when it was just all systems go in terms of 
um, wanting to kill myself. I had attempted suicide probably twice. Um, I think I'm disclosing that for the first time with you guys because my mom only knows it like once and she doesn't even think it was that hectic. But I started, I started to just contemplate living. I did not want to finish my final year of university. This was my final year and then I was done. And even university was a lot for me at the time. And uh, even worse, I think, is that, like uh, Dr. Cindy Fonsell said, is that the, the, friendships, the friendships around you, the people who are around you, when they don't support you or they don't see the problems and you keep on telling them that, look, I have depression, anxiety, there's something wrong with me, I want to kill myself, it doesn't make any sense. They don't understand that because they're not going through it. So when they don't go through it, they're like, well, you're okay. You know, you're just acting up, you know, like live your youth. And sometimes I look at even the phrase live your youth and I just haven't felt like that type of person, you know, to just live my youth. And I was 21 at the time. So looking at all of that, um, I had started to realize that, okay, cool, I'm spiraling out of control in the sense of I started to, you know, uh, drink a lot heavier now. Like whenever I'd go out, I just drink heavier and drink heavier. And I'm not that type of person even at home. I don't even drink at home. I hardly drink when I can, but now I was just drinking heavier every single time I could. So the money that I would get from the work I used to do back then, just coaching and whatnot, I would just you know, wasted away in, try, in trying to numb the feeling, numb the pain away, because I didn't understand what was happening around me. So eventually I started to get a friend, um, a friend of mine um, who's my mentor spoke to me on the side and she said to me, you know what, dude, you need, a, you need some help. Like this can't continue because I, there's a time I just went away from my house and uh, I left, like I completely left the house on Saturday morning, did not talk to any single person. No one could contact me, no one could reach me. And I just drove off as far as I can from at home. And I live in Orlando, West Soweto. So I just decided to just drive all the way off and find like find a place where I can like make sense of everything. And I just started taking pills along with um, alcohol and just saying, you know what, it's time. Like, let me just, you know, go with it. I'm, I'm over it. I'm over every single thing that is happening. Um, and at that point, like there's a, there's a part of me that clicked, thankfully, to my sister. She had called me and she had said, you can't be doing this. You can't be doing this to us. You can't be doing this to your mother. And in particular, my mom, because I told her that, mom, I want to die. Like I told her straight up, this is what I want to happen. And she cried and she said, there's no way I brought you on this earth and there's great things you need to do. And there's no way that you're going to leave. It's not going to happen on my account. There's no way we're going to help you. And I think looking at black families in general, that never happens. You can ask any single uh, black person about mental health, especially in the black community, like Dr. Cindy Fancel explained. It's not easy to get that type of support, but my mom was very supportive with it. And she, said, and she said, you know what, what I'm going to do is you're going to find help. We're going to make a way. So I went to my GP, spoke to my GP and I said, listen, I need help. I've attempted suicide. I'm not, um, I don't want to be around anyone. I just want to be by myself. I want to sleep the whole day. I'm not motivated anymore in my academics, like everything around me. I'm just not in the mood. So obviously uh, my GP had decided that, okay, cool. We're going to help you out in the best way we can. And he uh, admitted me to a Kiso in Parktown. And to be honest with you, that was probably one of the best times I've had in general, I think, um, being at a Kiso, because it's such a, a great institution in which, you know, they try and help you out and make you understand, you know, everything that you're going through and also put you on medication. And sometimes, you know, I think that the most important part is that the medication isn't going to change you. It's not going to change everything. It helps, yes. But therapy is the biggest thing and i think the the hardest challenge for people in the in, in the community in general and i'm talking about people who are not like me where i'm privileged enough to go and see a psychologist or whatever i'm talking about people who are here in the streets in, in soweto where you can't you can't afford to find a, a, um, that type of psychological help and i was very lucky enough to get that and it was an amazing time because it helped me figure out a lot and it helped me in time just before i could do my my final exams for my degree and luckily i had passed and everything had passed with that but it's very difficult to speak to people um, about what you're going through. And it's very difficult to, for people to understand what you're going through as well. And uh, I've, I've, I've seen what uh, Dr. Cindy Fonsell said earlier, which was the fact that you can preach it how many times, it doesn't matter how people see it, you know? And she's right, because I've been that person who's been trying to make a lot of people understand and not a lot of them get it. They're like, we don't know what you're talking about. So it's, it's, it's been a tough time from 2018 and 2019 was also very difficult as well. But I think what got even much more difficult was during lockdown, especially because I just let go of doing campus radio. And I was like, I need to change my life. My mom is retiring. I need to find somewhere of income. And I found a decent job. And then lockdown came and it was very, very difficult for me and a lot of my friends. Because for a lot of us, we had started 
um, basically now, you know, getting jobs, thinking about apartments, all, all these things that we just dream about. And now all of that was dashed. And that's, that's why the pandemic itself was one of the most difficult times for a lot of South African youth, because now a lot of people are starting to face their demons and they couldn't realize that, okay, cool. How am I going to have a discussion about what I'm going through? Because I don't want to be labeled as the type of person that is weak, because that's how they see a lot of youngsters like seeing people with mental health, like, oh, you're just being weak, you know, you just need to figure it out. And sometimes those problems also do stem from social media. And that's why it's important for me to now regulate my time on social media because I realize I'm on it so much and I'm looking at so many other people's lives, comparing it to myself at my age. And I'm like, I'm 23, I'm still at home and I'm still trying to figure out a lot of things. And some people are out there enjoying their money, splashing their money. I'm trying to find a job, it's difficult. And it messes with you sometimes. So that, that's why it's also important to also try and you know, limit the amount of time you spend on social media because you just end up being in a, in a, in a comparison bubble. Right? It's, it's there, you're always comparing. Um, and yeah, it's, it's very difficult. And also I think um, as well with, the, with therapy itself, I had gone through the therapy um, before the pandemic hit. And obviously when the pandemic hit, all my therapy was gone. So now I had to figure out a way as to how do I love myself and uh, love myself more and trying to figure out myself more without the help of a therapist because a therapist is there to help you out, figure out all your problems and you try and, you know, fight them and niggle them. And that's what you do. You know, I just started, this is my first year in, in a long time where I was like, I know who my friends are. These are my friends. These are the most important people in my life and I'm okay with that. And I lost a lot of friends um, going through what I've went through so far because they never understood but at the end of the day, it's about me understanding what type of help I need and finding that type of help itself and trying to spread, you know, the message uh, more importantly in, in, in the black and the colored communities, mostly because a lot of people in those communities feel that mental health is not a serious thing. You're just acting up and we need to pray for you. You need to get, to, we're not going to get any kind of um, traditional help. You need to pray. That's the only way you can find a solution. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, that's how it's been for me. And that, that's how I look at my story. But so far, I've realized at the end of the day that how I improve my mental health is through reading, is through my medication, but at the same time through, you know, um, loving myself. And I think that's the biggest thing is to love yourself. You know, find the little victories that happen in your life. You need to start embracing them and looking at them and saying, yes, this is amazing. I love it. Let's see where else I can go. And I think um, that's the most important thing. Thanks. Thank you so much, Taba. I think I really admire how courageous you are and brave to share that story. And, and it's actually amazing because you're only 23, yet you're, you're very descriptive and you're very, I think you're going to be the one to inspire others moving forward, particularly as we move um, with youth mental health. That's, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. And I'm really sorry about the, the introducing you wrong. It's on the chat now. Maki has fixed everything. So you're all, all sorts of now. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Marlise, who is going to manage um, the, or facilitate the discussion questions. So over to you, Marlise. Thank you, Kat. Uh, how much time do we have for questions? Is it three minutes or is there a little bit more? We could do maybe a bit more, but if people have to leave, then they could leave. We could do that. Maybe, maybe give it eight minutes. <laughs> <clears throat> I have looked over the questions in the chat box and I'm going to highlight two for Crick at the moment, which is one is around the South African National Mental Health Policy Framework and Strategic Plan coming to an end. And a question about if you have any input on when will it be updated. And there was also a question around the data that you presented and what you consider to be contributing factors to the uh, readmissions. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Marlies. And, and thanks, everyone, for the questions. Before I respond to them, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to both Cindy and Tabo for that incredible stories that you've been sharing today and your, your enormous courage in facing what you're facing and your willingness to share your stories, because I think through sharing your stories, so many other people can benefit. So thank you so much. Um, so just to respond on those couple of questions, you're absolutely right. And I think it was uh, Dylan who posed the question about the mental health policy. It was from 2013 to 2020. So as of uh, 31st of December, it will be up. I'm actually uh, not sure whether the, the Department of Health is planning to renew or extend the current policy or will be revising the policy. Um, but I think you can direct questions to the National Director of Mental Health and Substance Abuse uh, Mr. Sofiso Pagati in, in the National Department of Health, and I'm sure he'd be able to respond to that. Um, then in terms of the reasons for the higher readmissions, 
typically that's often because there's a lack of continuity of care. So people get the help they need in an inpatient setting, they, they feel better, they're on a journey to recovery, they're then discharged, but there's no linkage to either a primary care clinic or a community-based facility. And, and as a result, they can uh, frequently relapse and need to be readmitted again. And so that's one of the main drivers behind the high readmission rate. So there are two you know, really important solutions. The first is to build linkage to care, so to make sure that people are referred to a support person uh, in the community or in the primary care clinic. And also, very importantly, that there's ongoing support in the community and in the primary care clinics. So those are my answers to those questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Quick. Cassie, I've also got two questions for you, and apologies to those who submitted more questions. Um, I've got uh, a question for you on the proportion of calls related to anxiety and depression um, from the, the data that you presented. And also, if you could uh, tell us what you think the most important takeaway is from delivering online counselling. Thanks, Cassie. Thank Thank you so much and, and thanks for the questions and you know I'll also try to go through the ones we don't get to now and just try to answer them and I'll post my email address in the chat box. You're welcome to reach out. We always love to engage. I think what we've seen as, as a common theme, especially during COVID, is definitely depression and anxiety being the leading reasons people are calling in. Um, but often it's a combination of issues and a combination of stresses or triggers that make people reach out and, and call us. So the top calls would be depression, anxiety, trauma, suicide, and substance abuse. Some of our, our key take home from online counseling, and again, we're learning every day is we can't put in automatic messages or bots or algorithms as a response in online counseling as perhaps other um, organizations overseas do a lot is they, they, they automate a lot of their responses, is that we really do find a much better response when it's personal messages, personal response, which can be a bit more time consuming, but I think it's more important in building that relationship because we have to work so much harder in building trust and, and building conversation on the online platform. Um, so that's also really important to us is to make it personal. And often people go online to test something or to share openly because you can't see my face, you can't hear my voice, so it's easier to share and then we always try to motivate doing a phone call and some kind of connection afterwards or, or further on to help them because we're able to help uh, people more on the phone because you can hear them, you can really help them onto the next step. So um, it's definitely something that we will also be uh, doing some research on um, in, the, in the next coming months. So thanks for those questions. Thanks, Cassie. Um, Tabo and Cindy, you would have seen in the comments that there's just been an outpour of um, of support and, and congratulations and gratitude for, for you sharing your stories. I was wondering if we might be able to, to conclude perhaps the question uh, to both of you, which is, what would you say was the biggest challenge in terms of you speaking out um, about your experience? I know people have to been talking about race and masculinity. Do you have any thoughts on what was perhaps your biggest challenge and what really helped you to get over that challenge? And I'm going to ask Cindy to go first and then Tabo still has some, some time to think about this question. Please go ahead, Cindy. So the biggest challenge is that when you do disclose that you're living with a mental illness, all the behavior that you've displayed prior to, to your disclosure and everything else that you do thereafter is judged on your mental illness. So a simple thing, I mean, I love champagne. So a simple thing like liking champagne now becomes, oh, no wonder she drinks champagne so much. And no, but everything is attributed to my depression. And you know what? The only way to deal with it is just to get on with your life. Um, I've cut out toxic people. I've cut out people that don't understand who I am, that, that my mom's passing away changed me, that I'm a different person because of depression. If you can't understand that, then you have no place in my life. So I've learned to, to not take any of that to heart because my sharing of my story um, helps people. And that's really what I want to do. I want people to get the help that I got because if I didn't get this help, I wouldn't be alive today. That's, that's, that, that's been the hardest, that was the hardest thing. Um, yeah, just to follow that, up, um, I think I, I agree with you on that, on that perspective. Like for me, it was the same thing. So um, you just knew it's, it's very hard to, to, to let go of certain people in your life, you know, because you've grown with them for years. I know I had friends that I had had for five years and I cut a lot of them out because they could not understand what I'm going through. But um, it's just 
how everyone looks at every single act as if like you know you're in danger you're in trouble so every single time you're like sad like you could be sad like this much and so even like it's not heavy it's just a little bit and someone's really like judging you and feeling like oh here he goes again he's about to go through um you know suicide and he wants to kill himself we're not ready for that and it's like i don't do that you know i'm i'm, I'm i go through things and i'll deal with them but it's not it doesn't mean that you know what i'm going through is going to be there for the longest of times like it's a small thing it's a bump and i move on i carry on and i lift myself up so that's the hardest challenge is, is people, you know, to, trying to figure out the difference between, you know, your mental health and when you're genuinely sad or genuinely happy. But everyone just attributes things to, oh, it's definitely he's acting up. Ooh, we're in trouble. So I think that's the hardest thing to to deal with. Thank you so much, Pablo. Kat, I'm going to hand back over to you. Oh, wonderful. Thanks, Marlies. So we are at the end. So before I hand um, over to Dr. Cindy to close our session, I just want to say thank you to all of those who attended our speakers. I think you're absolutely wonderful. And I think it was a nice mix between personal stories and some research and evidence. Um, yeah. And a special thank you to Marlies and Mahi also for the organization. So Dr. Cindy, I'll hand over to you. Well, I'd just like to say thank you um, to everyone for attending um, the Alan J. Fisher Center for Public Mental Health talk. Very important talk um, around mental health. These conversations must continue. And I'd also like to say a very special thank you from the Southern African Depression and Anxiety Group, SADAC, um, for you know giving us this platform to, to speak about the work that we do. And um, there's still so much to be done. And I think as Cassie pointed out and, and um, you know Professor Crick pointed out, um, yeah, we have a lot of work to do. Um, COVID-19 is definitely going to, you know, bring to the surface more mental health issues given all the stresses that people are going through. Um, so let's just be kind, let's help wherever we can, and let's change the healthcare system, mental health care system in South Africa. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thanks everyone. Have a great World Mental Health Day. <laughs>